All right, and thank you so much for joining me tonight, Tina. You're, you're my guest this week on uh, Pain Nation. I really appreciate you making the time to do this, considering it's Thanksgiving weekend in Canada. So welcome and thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, Ken. Well, I, I want to give the audience a little bit of background on, on you, and I would hope that you can share your experiences with chronic pain, how long it's been since you've been diagnosed, and really how that, in effect, changed your life. Oh yeah, it's been, it's been kind of like uh, riding in the front seat of a roller coaster. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> so, um, in 1997, I was in my first motor vehicle accident, and I actually had a, a, a roll off a 6,000 foot cliff in the California desert. And uh, surprisingly enough, because I was in such good physical shape at the time, I was swimming three miles a day. I was very active. I was a massage therapist. Um, I managed to rebound out of that and uh, climb out of that hole, you know, and with my yoga and my uh, knowledge of anatomy and physiology and that I managed to um, get better and go back to work full time. And then... In 2000, I was hit by a cab driver who was on a cell phone and kind of went forward and uh, injured my discs in my low back. And in 2005, I got hit twice in 12 hours. One, a cab was on his phone and he was distracted. He hit me and I was on the way to the vehicle reporting center. And a woman, an older lady, instead of putting her foot on the brake, and backing out of a parking spot, she gunned it and T-boned me. So I was hit like this, and then I was hit like that. So, and then <laughs> it gets better or worse, <laughs> depending on your the way you look at it. Uh, 2011, I had crawled out of the holes again twice, and physio and acupuncture and medication and alternative medicine, and I was just starting to be pain-free again in 2011 and it was a snowstorm and a woman lost control of her car and hit me head on so I got thrown back and into the curb and that was what really did it for me it was the multiple uh, trauma to the same areas the neck the low back and the hip so I was diagnosed with um, lumbar sacroiliac joint dysfunction and a third degree ligament tear in my pelvis so it really took a long time for the medical profession to um, diagnose what was going on because of all the trauma. You know, first they thought it was just soft tissue trauma. It was muscular skeletal. They tried to give me NSAIDs, which gave me a bleeding ulcer and wrecked my digestion for years. And then lo and behold, I think it was 2005, this very compassionate pain doctor um, who did nerve blocks, uh, agreed to take me on. And then it was like magic, you know, magic in so far as there was some relief, there was definitive relief. And since then, I've been able like to sit and travel a little bit, but my life is nowhere near what it was. My personality's changed. I was happy, go lucky, energetic, a social butterfly. And now I have to pick and choose. If I wash dishes, I can't do laundry. If I do shopping, I can't cook. So every day is about a delicate, delicate balance of if I do one thing, uh, then I can't do another, or I can be out for weeks. Now, you, your life sounds like a bad Roadrunner cartoon. If you're <laughs> playing the part of Wile E. Coyote, that's, I, it's, you, you can't write, people write fiction like this, but this doesn't happen <laughs> to no, people no, it, it all doesn't. in the same lifetime. That's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. I, so, okay, so you've had this, uh, all these multiple injuries that have dramatically changed the progress of what you probably imagined for yourself as far as the way your life was going to go. So how do you go from, from that, from these multiple injuries, all this pain, to give pain a voice how did that start it, it, it's it was an interesting and organic progression i met my current creative partner bob Schubring, who's on all the facebook boards with me 
and he was developing a uh, a documentary called uh, Pain Body, and uh, so we he was trying to get funding for it. And my background is in documentary filmmaking and acting and producing, and so we thought, well. You know, it takes a long time to get a, a motion picture funded, but why don't we start uh, off bite-sized? So three years ago, we set up Chronic Pain TV, which is similar to your wonderful efforts, which I applaud you for. We shot some videos, mostly me as the guinea pig, Tina getting cold laser therapy, Tina getting 200 acupuncture needles in her back, Tina getting intermuscular stimulation, Tina getting nerve blocks. So it was basically my back saw more FaceTime uh, in video than uh, probably anyone in history of uh, film and television. And so we collaborated with researchers and doctors and scientists, and we set up chronicpaintv.com with little videos. And so you've been diagnosed with chronic pain, what to do. And so this continued on and we were active in social media. And then one day I woke up and I thought, we really need to do something active. Like this is passive and it's wonderful and it's educational, but we really need to give pain a voice. Aha. So then I thought, give pain a voice. Like I thought, thank you, God. You know, like it was kind of like being hit on the head that there's all of these pain societies, the fibro society, the arthritis society, chronic fatigue syndrome, CRPS, um, trigeminal neuralgia. And the thing is, is like, we're almost like all competing for airspace or space uh, uh, real estate on social media. And I thought, no wonder we're not cohesive as a pain community, 100 million strong in the US and 7 million strong in Canada, like that's a huge voting block. Many of us are adults. So we set up Give Pain a Voice. Bob and I collaborated on this uh, a year ago. And what we've been doing um, since then is through social media, attempting to rally people together with a common focus is we all have pain. We all have a voice. So let's give pain a voice, you know, and not to oversimplify it, but it's like, it's a starting place. It's a grassroots place where we can come together with a commonality of we're being marginalized, we're being shunned, um, and what do we do about it? We lobby, we speak up, we're proactive in whatever small way we can. So that's kind of how it came into being. Okay. I would like to get your take uh, just really quick. We've got about two minutes left on something that's happening here in the US and I'm, I've heard echoes of it in Canada, though I don't know if it's as bad there, but we are having uh, an increasing problem here in the United States of people with legitimate pain pill prescriptions unable to get those prescriptions filled at pharmacies for a number of reasons. Sometimes it's because there are actual medication shortages uh, that are a direct result of some new legislation from the, the DEA. And then other times, uh, some of these corporate pharmacy conglomerates have empowered their uh, pharmacists to just use their own judgment as to deciding if they want to fill someone's pain pill prescription, even if it's completely legitimate from a doctor and it's and they should by all rights fill it. They're just choosing not to for whatever reason that they, they want to and there's no accountability there. Is something similar to that happening in Canada? We have similar issues, not quite that. Um, I am not on opioids, but I do believe that everything that's possibly available for a pain patient that will help them, whether it be medical marijuana, opioids, nerve blocks, ketamine infusions, you know, I'm really a big fan and an advocate of getting help wherever you can in an appropriate fashion and timely fashion. So, so far, you know, knock on wood, <laughs> Um, the opioid problem is not looming in Canada. You still have to have a contract with your pain doctor. You still have to do a urine sample before you get your prescription. The pharmacies are not refusing prescriptions, but our issues are happening in a parallel journey is that the government's cut back funding of pain clinics. They don't find them, you know, a necessity. So what's happened is people are waiting a longer time to get diagnosed and treated. 
uh, the government's contribution to pain clinics um, was reduced, I think, by 40% the last year, which is their overhead. So some of them have had to go out of business. So we are having similar problems, but not the same. And a lot of it has to do with bureaucracy. And, you know, people are making decisions in governmental bodies, you know, like our government, politics, the DEA in the States, you know, the organizations here, where they, they're they not they're not living in the day-to-day -day reality that we live in. So by the time their decisions trickle down to us, you know, we're the ones who are suffering because of it. So there's a big gap between what's happening and what needs to happen in order for pain to be um, under control. And I know we have a short bit of time, but you know, the reality is it cost the U.S. $635 billion a year in lost wages, treatment, and productivity. So you would think, you know, this is a pandemic. And, you know, one of our catchphrases is we're living in a pandemic of denial. When the baby boomers in 2020 uh, turn 65, they're going to use up to 78% of their lifetime health care costs. So it benefits everyone to address the chronic pain situation in a manageable way where pain, pain patients can get timely, appropriate treatment. And many of us want to go back to work and want to be a productive part of society. So it's actually there's a disconnect in both of our countries that we need to fix. I couldn't agree more with, uh, with everything that you just said. I, I really believe that, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the uh, governmental agencies such as the DEA are only focused on a certain set of numbers having to do with uh, the so-called uh, opioid overdose epidemic, of which there really isn't one, but that's the subject yeah, for a, a different video. Uh, real quick, if you wouldn't mind, is there a central place that people can go, like a website, if they want to learn more about uh, Give Pain a Voice as an organization and how they can do their part to, to come together uh, in this Yes, effort? absolutely. We're, um, you know, www.givepainavoice.org. Um, we're on social media, um, Twitter at Give Pain a Voice. Facebook, Give Pain a Voice, and um, although we're based out of Canada, we're very actively applying for government funding. Whatever printed materials, educational materials we develop in Canada for our demographic, we're going to translate um, uh, for the U.S. demographic. So, you know, we are working on an international scope with Australia, Ireland, the U.K., and uh, so... Uh, we welcome people joining the advocacy train, and we need more people to give pain a voice. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, listen, I won't keep you any longer. Thank you so much, Tina, and happy Canadian Thanksgiving to you, and enjoy that that, that turkey. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll see you take soon. care.